Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, <clears throat> uh, welcome at the uh, uh, webinar of the uh, SOE uh, in the strabismus uh, session. Uh, uh, I would like to welcome you on behalf of the SOE, but also from the uh, ESA, the European Strabismus uh, Association, and, of, uh, and uh, from the IPOSC, the International Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus Council. Um, before we begin, uh, I would like to uh, run through some quick uh, housekeeping items. Uh, audience questions you can uh, put uh, at the Q&A uh, um, uh, knob uh, and we will be looking at them and after each session we will uh, 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 give them to the uh, presenter. Um, if uh, we don't have time for that, uh, there is a three minute uh, time slot for that. Uh, if your answer, uh, if your question is not uh, answered quickly enough, then uh, we will uh, do that separately by email. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and uh, will be available later at the SOE uh, website and placed at the SOE uh, YouTube uh, channel. Uh, I would uh, uh, also talk you through the running order for today. There will be uh, six presentation in total and after each presentation, a short Q&A will take place. Uh, so make sure you submit your question uh, in time so we can uh, uh, answer it. Uh, today will be an uh, overlook on uh, uh, new uh, uh, strabismus uh, surgical technique, but also uh, on uh, how to deal with strabismus uh, in, uh, in a different way. And uh, I would like to uh, give uh, John Sloper, my uh, co-moderator and president of the uh, European Strabismus Association, uh, now the microphone and camera to introduce the first speaker. Right, welcome on behalf of the ESA. Our first speaker is Oliver Erd, Professor of Ophthalmology in Munich in Germany, and he's going to talk about eye muscle tendon elongation, what you can do when you run out of enough muscle to move the muscle back as far as you want to. Oliver, thank you very much. Welcome to a short talk on muscle tendon elongation, which is one way of weakening a muscle, something we very frequently do in strabismus surgery. We may use it as a one muscle procedure or bilateral weakening procedures. We may use it in combined surgery and weakening a muscle is mandatory in restrictive strabismus and in congenital disinnervation syndromes. Here we have an example of a patient with restrictive Graves' orbitopathy. There are some limitations when you weaken a muscle. One is the arc of contact. For example, on the left side, you see a normal muscle. When it, uh, the muscle contracts, the eyeball rotates, but the muscle force is still uh, maximum to rotate the globe because it's perpendicular to the surface of the globe. Whereas if you have a recessed muscle like here in the middle, you will see once the muscle is in action, the muscle loses contact with the globe and now the muscle force is no longer tangential to the surface of the globe and only this part of the force is working to rotate the eye. So you get a limitation of motility the further recessed you have a muscle. This can be avoided by not attaching the muscle to the globe, but elongating the muscle and attaching it at the original insertion. Now again, the muscle force is transmitted perpendicular to the surface of the globe, so you have maximum adduction uh, forces acting on the globe. There are other limitations when you weaken a muscle. One is the interaction with the pulleys, which occurs when the muscle is more than 10 to 14 millimeters recessed, weakening the effect of your recession, and 
the overall shortening of a muscle is limited by the sarcomere shortening. So again, when you get more than 13 or 15 millimeters, the muscle cannot get shorter anymore. When you do muscle elongation, the arc of contact as shown can be improved. However, elongation of the tendon does not reduce the effect of interaction with the pulleys or sarcomere shortening. So how to elongate a muscle? There are many different techniques. The most simple one is hang back sutures, which I don't do anymore, which I don't like because the reattachment of the muscle is less predictable. And um, so I prefer a fixed amount of recession or elongation. There have been several artificial materials used, silicone, Gore-Tex, Mersilane, but they may cause permanent foreign body reactions and conjunctival erosions. You can use fascialata, but again, this makes the surgery much more difficult because you have to retrieve the material and you may have muscle reconstruction, Z-plasty or other techniques, which may be, uh, yeah, does just elongates the muscle, but makes it much slimmer. And my preferred way of muscle elongation is using bovine pericardium, which is commercialized under the name of Tutopatch. I do not have any commercial interest in this product. It's bovine pericardium and it's processed to remove cells, pathogens, any bacteria or virus which may be in the pericard, and then it's dehydrated so it can be stored under room temperature. And once you use it, you put it into saline solution and after five minutes, it's flexible and can be used for your surgery. It is replaced by connective tissue of the body, the patient, uh, over weeks and uh, gives an appearance which after a while looks just like normal tendon or nearly normal tendon. Um, the advantage is that it gives a very well-defined reattachment of the muscle and uh, so it ha you have a defined elongation of the muscle and recession if you want and there are no adhesions from the tuto patch with the sclera, except at the location where you suture it to the sclera. So it can easily be revised and does not cause a lot of scarring. So what are my surgical steps? Here I have a muscle which I want to recess and elongate the tendon. I take a patch of, um, a stripe of tuto patch at uh, which is just the same width as the muscle, I attach it with non-resorbable, uh, with resorbable sutures can be used, and I detach the muscle and let the muscle slip back. Then I reattach the tutor patch to the sclera with a recession and muscle elongation, which gives me the total effect of my surgery. Afterwards, I just detach or cut away the anterior part of the tutu patch. As I said, resorbable sutures can be used because the tutu patch will be resorbed and replaced by uh, tissue of the patient. Why do I use a recession on top of elongation? First, I have less bovine material in the patient afterwards, and I often have to recess the conjunctiva as well, and I want the, inser the new insertion to be covered with conjunctiva. So a recession combined with elongation is most useful. Most of the time, I do use tuto patch elongation in revision surgery. So the muscle is already recessed, often quite far away from the limbus. Again, I take my tutor patch, attach it to the muscle, 
I let it slip back further, and then I reattach it a bit anterior to the last insertion I had, because often it's far away and I want to have a good arc of contact for my tutu patch new tendon. So I have an elongation, uh, my net elongation is calculated by the uh, size of the interponate subtracted by the advancement which I use. There have been some, um, a lot of studies and research uh, presented, which I had shown on the previous slide. Often I do a recession and elongation or advancement and elongation. The maximum of recess and elongation should not exceed 13 millimeters because you will get adduction deficit due to the shortening of your sarcomeres and interference with the pulleys. The effect is difficult to predict. On average, there are 2.5 to 3.5 prison diopters per millimeter, but the effect is very variable and it does cause some limitation of motility. Here is a um, dose response curve presented by Uvenhaus aus, uh, uh, from Essen in Germany. And uh, I will present a patient which I operated, uh, a patient with Graves' disease who has a severe limitation of elevation of the left eye. So this is in primary position and up gaze. In side gaze, you see especially the limitation of elevation in abduction, typical of Graves' disease. So what I did in this patient was an inferior rectus recession of four millimeters and 10 millimeters muscle elongation. And this gave a very satisfactory result. In primary position, there's orthotropia with a mild hypophoria of the left eye on cover testing. But the patient could fuse this small residual deviation and elevation now is possible beyond midline, but still limited. And down gaze is very well preserved, but slightly limited. So this patient had a very successful result. So this patient ended up with a very nice field of binocular single vision, allowing 10 degrees of up gaze and 20 degrees of down gaze. So when to consider elongation? Most patients do have severe restrictive strabismus like Graves' disease, I sometimes use it in disinnervation syndromes, fibrosis syndrome to elevate both eyes. I don't use it in Duane's because it has been reported that it does reduce the adduction of the medial rectus muscle if you use tutu patch here. Um, I prefer transposition in Duane's if necessary. You can use it in paralytic strabismus. I advise to use it most of the time for revision surgery, because when I use elongation surgery as a primary procedure, I had some over effects and severe limitations of motility. So I have returned to use it for revision surgery only. You can use it if the patient refuses surgery on the sound eye and you have to get more effect on the already operated eye. And you may also use it if you find very abnormal sclera posterior to the insertion. So you can reattach the muscle to the original insertion um, using the tutor patch. So as a summary, I keep this slide and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you for your attention.
Oliver, thank you very much indeed. That was very interesting. Uh, one point that you made was it is very variable in its outcome. Have you tried using it with adjustable sutures? I mean, is, is it feasible to use it with adjustable sutures? I don't believe in adjustable sutures because <laughs> the adjustment, yes, the adjustment must be done the day after surgery. And often you get a very variable adaptation even weeks after surgery, especially in Graves' disease. So I have seen significant improvements. And if I had adjusted, I would be worried to get an overcorrection too early. So that's why I don't use adjustable sutures. Uh, Oliver, have you uh, ever uh, used it in uh, congenital fibrosis uh, syndrome, uh, where you have a very, very tight uh, inferior rectus in children? Yes, as a second procedure. So they had previous recessions, long distance, and it wasn't enough. So I put in a tuto patch and it gave quite satisfactory results. No motility, but the chin up position was gone. Yes. And uh, how expensive is, is this uh, tutu patch? It comes in different sizes and we need a smallest size usually, and it's mm -hmm. uh, around a hundred euros. Okay. Per, but, but, and you can use it for both eyes if you do bilateral okay. surgery. Yeah. And, and no questions about prions and mad cow disease from patients? There has not, not, nothing has been reported and the uh, company keeps the process a little bit of a secret, but they promise that all pathogens are removed and uh, um, I couldn't find any report of um, uh, transmitted diseases with a tutu patch. Yeah. How often have you reoperated on patients who've had tutu patch and what did you find? Sorry, reoperate. Uh, mm. Perhaps I had five reoperations, and it was quite easy to re, uh, to revise. I was quite amazed. I was expecting more scarring, but actually there's very little scar in it, and it looks like um, normal, nearly normal tendon. Mm. And the mm. earliest I have gone back is after three months already. Mm. Thank you, uh, Oliver. Welcome. Uh, and I think we can move to the next uh, presentation. And thank you, Oliver. And uh, that will be uh, our second speaker, Daniela uh, Cioplian, uh, who will discuss management of consecutive exotropia. And uh, uh, Daniela is uh, uh, one of the uh, more famous uh, strabismologists uh, in uh, her country, in uh, Romania. And we know each other for uh, a long, long time, 25 years now. I think in Jerusalem was the first time that we uh, met during an ASA meeting. So Daniela, uh, please go ahead uh, with the management of consecutive exotropia. Hello, dear colleagues. I'm Daniela Troplan from Romania, and I'm gonna talk on the management of consecutive exotropia. Thank you for the invitation. I have no financial interest to disclose in this presentation. Consecutive exotropia is the exotropia resulting early or late after cerebral isotropia. There are different causes for this as overcorrection, mechanical causes, and unknown causes, which produce the exoshift long time after good alignment among the lifespan. Early overcorrection is not unusual and it can, it can happen because of several human errors as angle overestimation, incomplete or insufficient refraction assessment, pre-op deviation measurements, errors or undiagnosed abnormal ACA ratio. There are also predisposing factors for CXT onset as high hyperopia, high amblyopia, even treated, lack of fusion, poor accommodation, and constitutional factors as prematurity or associated neurological disorders. If an overcorrection under 15 priest diopters is present with good adduction and the patient has a low hyperopia, decrease the glossy spherical correction only if visual acuity is not affected. Botulinum toxin in the lateral rectus muscle can be an alternative. 
If the patient is binocular, just wait and follow and uh, even exophoria is present. In myopic or emetropic patients, over minus lenses or prism can be used for preserving fusion. If decompensates or the patient refuses conservative treatment, reoperate. Treat it as primary XT only if the medial rectus muscle looks and works normally, but attention to nomograms, we deal with previously operated muscles. If two months post-op the deviation is larger than 15 pistols, consider reoperation. If normal A deduction is present on and the medial rectus muscle looks normal intraoperatively, depending on the deviation quantity, we can operate one or two muscles, advancing the medial rectus or recti and or recessing the lateral rectus muscle, or again, we can try botulinum toxin. If limited A deduction is observed, abnormal attachment to the sclera of the medial rectus muscle or disinserted medial rectus muscle should be suspected. The mechanical causes of CXT are abnormal attachments to the sclera of the medial rectus muscle as stress scar or slip muscle, absent attachment of the medial rectus muscle, meaning lost muscle or disinserted muscle, and restricted lateral rectus muscle consecutive to vicious scarring of the muscle and conjunctiva. Several types of abnormal attachments to the sclera following to medial rectus muscle surgery for esotropia have been identified. Medial rectus muscle stretch scar, slipped medial rectus muscle, and two particular types of attachments are medial rectus tenotomy and after medial rectus muscle scleral elongation, as you can observe in this picture. In one of our retrospective studies, we found that about 84% of the CXT cases with abnormal attachments of the medial rectus muscle to the sclera have been either slip muscles or stretch scar cases. Few examples of stretch scar. The length of the scar is usually small, the deduction is good to fair, and this is the result of abnormal healing of the muscle attachment. The main cause of the abnormal healing is the reparation collagen poor quality. Abnormal healing of the wound was observed in all types of surgery, but in strabismus surgery is usually found in all operated nerves. In the management of CXT due to stress scar of the medial rectus muscle, Ludwig and her co-author suggest the stretch scar resection and propose a formula for finding the new target insertion, which is named T, of the medial rectus muscle by calculating the sum between the distance from the original position uh, and the place where the medial rectus muscle was found and the length of the stretch scar, and then subtracting the recommended amount of the resection found in the nomograms. The non-absorbable sutures and supplementary securing lock are necessary for the new muscle insertion in order to avoid reoccurrence. In our cases, the stress scar length was less than six millimeters in all cases, and the resected amount was the equivalent of the medial rectus muscle resection from the nomogram augmented by approximately, it's just, just a suggestion, 10% more or less. The idea, is, the idea is that we have to resect the, and advance a little bit more when we deal with stress scar muscle than in the case of a normal muscle. We currently use a resorbable 6O suture reinforced by 5O nylon suture trying to avoid a new stress scar and CXT reoccurrence. The slippage, another type of uh, abnormal attachment, the slippage of the medial rectus muscle can happen in the next days after or after surgery and usually is accompanied by a slight to severe limitation of the A deduction in the field of action of the affected muscle. The slippage is defined as the retraction of the muscle posteriorly within, within its capsule, only the capsule remaining attached to the sclera. There are few intra-op tests which can help us to diagnose the slip muscle. A positive spring back test, we can see the hook through the, mass, the, to the, uh, through the capsule, meaning a positive see-through test. And we can feel the denivelation between the capsule and the muscle by passing a small hook underneath the muscle. This is the positive step test. The slippage causes are usually inappropriate surgical techniques. The muscle look uh, lock too close to the insertion or too superficial without securing, muscu securing muscular fibers, inadequate needle instruments or suture, but mostly inadequate passage 
of the needle into the sclera or muscle, too short or too superficial. Of course, there are also favorizing factors for slippage as the muscle contractor or stiffness, concomitant strengthening of the antagonist, restriction on the antagonist, previous multiple surgery on the muscle or orbital restriction. During the surgery after medial rectus isolation, the pseudotendon identification, the needle should be inserted into the muscle behind the pseudotendon limit. It is mandatory to secure the middle fibers by a knot and to pass the wire through the two halves of the muscle and secure to secure by knots all the fibers. The pseudotendon has to be resected. The muscle will be, will be reattached to the sclera, avoiding to reinsert it too close to the limbus. Add another muscle surgery if the deviation is larger than 20 prism dial. This is a case of CXT with bilateral medial rectus slippage and only two muscle surgery on the medial recti consisting in pseudotendon resection and advancement was enough to correct more than 70 prism diopters and to improve the adduction. Most of cases in our cases series had a long, a long pseudotendons with an average length of 10 millimeters. The total amount of surgery for getting a good post-operative alignment was approximately 30% larger on the resected medial rectus than in the expected surgery corresponded, corresponding to the nomograms for primary exotropia at the same deviation quantities. In a very simple and very orientative formula, if the resection was 10 millimeters and you advance two millimeters, the total amount of your resection is 12 millimeter, which is the equivalent of 8.5 millimeters resection found in the nomograms, meaning 30% less. There is a big trap in sleep muscle surgery. Unrecognized, a slippage will lead to a surgery on the antagonist or to a pseudotendon partial resection with severe muscle retraction into the capsule and under correction followed by exotropia reoccurrence. A medial rectus, especially when tight or shortened, can be lost during the surgery. This can happen also in the first hours or days after surgery resulting in consecutive exotropia with severe AD deficit. This is an example. Left medial rectus was disinserted second day after surgery for consecutive XT. The muscle was previously resected two times. Probably the new insertion into the sclera was too superficial. The muscle was recovered one week after surgery, easy to be identified because of the suture on the muscle still, and it was correctly reinserted into the sclera. Eight years later, the patient is still orthotropic. The main purpose of surgery in a lost medial rectus muscle is to recover the muscle. If MRI dynamic or dynamic MRI of MRI are available and affordable, please image before. It is advisable to anchor and disinsert first the lateral rectus muscle if tight or to previously inject botulinum toxin uh, in it, decreasing the contractor in the lateral rectus muscle and facilitating the maneuvers for medial rectus recovery. The surgeon assistant needs experience in order to achieve the best exposure in the surgical field without mentioning the already very retracted medial rectus in the capsule. All the maneuvers should be very gentle. If it is a recent lost muscle, look after possible muscle sutures. In a late surgery, don't cut any possible attachments to the sclera of the medial rectus. Isolate any suspected attachments possibly connected with the muscle and follow the pathway until you identify the muscle. In that point, the pseudotendon becomes thicker and bluish, usually is very far into the deep orbit. If no attachments are identified, use hand-by-hand -hand maneuvers following the medial orbital wall there is possible to recover the muscle. Once identified, we used to apply a non-resorbable 5-0 traction suture into the muscle and then to gradually pull the muscle for a better exposure and mus uh, muscle final anchorage. Reject the non-muscular pseudotendon if present and reinsert the muscle, but not too close to the limbus. Adjust the lateral rectus muscle new position by using the force duction test. 
If the medial rectus is not found, we can try a full or partial tendon transfer from the vertical muscles, but I have never done this. Accidents can happen during the surgery of seeking the medial rectus, including to definitive loss of muscle. The lack of experience can make the things to get worse. So in this situation, it's better to stop, to close, and to repeat imaging, preparing a new surgery, maybe asking the help, the help of a more experienced colleague. In conclusion, surgical treatment success in CXT is related to the pre-op and intra-op accurate evaluation of the exodeviation origin and quantity. Recurrent CXT is a signal that we missed something, especially when limited A deduction is observed. Mechanical cause of CXT should be always removed. In most cases, two muscle surgery is necessary and enough. The new, the new muscle insertion target is always a challenge and usual nomograms or suggested suggestions can be used only for orientation. Botulinum toxin is an excellent help in achieving good result. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, uh, Daniela, <clears throat> for your uh, nice uh, overview of uh, this um, um, problem, which can occur either uh, very shortly after surgery or um, in uh, a long term. When I was a fellow a uh, long, long time ago, Gunther von Lorden, uh, he always said, if you find a uh, slit muscle, uh, go for the beef. Uh, and you uh, explained that uh, very uh, clearly that uh, you uh, have to uh, take out the pseudo muscle and uh, go for the, uh, for, the, uh, for the real uh, muscle tissue and that you can uh, advance. Um, I don't see any uh, questions from uh, the audience. Um, John, do you have any questions? Yeah. Daniela, would you generally do a medial rectus advancement and lateral rectus recession on the eye that's divergent, or do you ever do bilateral lateral rectus recessions? Uh, it depends. <laughs> It depends. Uh, you are talking about consecutive X XT or um, generally? Consecutive XT. Consecutive XT. Consecutive XT. Uh, yes, uh, especially if I see a uh, limited day deduction, I suspect that it's possible to be a slip muscle, muscle there. Or if I have amblyopia, for instance. If yeah. there is amblyopia, of course, I, I do recess reset procedures uh, or recess advanced, advanced advancing procedures. But um, if I have a good a deduction on both eyes, um, probably I, I intend to use a bilateral medial rectus, uh, lateral rectus recession, especially when I have good vision on both eyes. And um, it, this is my choice usually. I must say my reservation about that is that these patients tend to re-diverge. And so you may want to do a recess effect on the other eye in. 10 or 15 years time if, they, if they've re-diverged. That's possible, but this thing can happen also if uh, we do recess reset procedures, because now I have more than 20 years. Oh, oh they, they, they can recur, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yes. yes. Uh, but uh, sometimes it's very tricky because it can be a, a small slippage or it can be a stress scar. And I think this is the main cause of this reoccurrence, those stretch scars. Uh, patients uh, tend to re-become exotropic, especially because this, this uh, muscle attachment is not um, a good one. Um, actually, the, the stretch scar tends to, uh, tends to elongate during the time. So uh, I think it's, it's very important to, to Take in consideration this uh, issue and this problem. Uh, I saw the most um, ca many cases of reoccurrences, and usually uh, you see this pseudo tendon or let's, let's say this part of the stretch car on both sides, and then you can explain uh, very well why. So then probably if the deduction is good, it's better to to go on the laterals because there is not so important if a stretch card happens there is not bad <laughs> because thank you 
Thank you, Daniela. We have to move on. Uh, John, would you like to, thank you, Daniela. And uh, John, would you like to introduce uh, the next speaker? Yeah, it's my great pleasure to introduce Jill Adams, a longstanding colleague from Morphe's Eye Hospital. Uh, Jill is going to talk about uh, surgery for restrictive strabismus, which can be very challenging. Thank you, Jill. Hello, and thank you very much for asking me to talk in this symposium. I'm Jill Adams from Moorfields Eye Hospital in London. Now I'm gonna talk about restrictive strabismus and most people will commonly associate that with thyroid eye disease, which I'm not gonna talk about. I'm gonna talk about other areas where strabismus surgeons get involved and the techniques that we can use to try and assist these often complicated and difficult problems. Surgery for diplopia after blowout fracture, this commonly affects men far more than women, and the restriction can be due to muscle entrapment, or it can follow the surgery um, to repair enophthalmos and the fracture. So it can be sort of primary or secondary. Now, this is a case in point. This is a young man who had a road traffic accident and as you can see, he's got significant enophthalmos, which was very troublesome to him aesthetically. And although he had no double vision, he opted for mesh repair by the maxillofacial team to improve the situation. And unfortunately, this resulted in double vision. Now you can see here the problem. Um, he's got two plates in, you can see them here and here and they have gone through and they have damaged and entrapped the inferior rectus muscle. So he's had the plates in for enophthalmos with no double vision, and now he's got double vision, which is very troublesome. So I've listed here the various things that a strabismus surgeon will think about when trying to deal with this problem. Um, following blowout fractures, so we can either move the muscles up, we can move the muscles down, we can recess muscles, we can work on the opposite side to try, try and balance the vector forces. But you have to look at each patient and you have to ask them what it is that bothers them most. Is it worse when they look straight ahead? Is it worse when they look up? Is it worse when they look down? So for this particular case, we had the plate removed by our orbital team, and then I moved the horizontal muscles, the medial and the lateral rectus muscles downward in an inverse nap procedure. So I took them down to the inferior rectus border, and we did a contralateral superior rectus recession and a contralateral inferior rectus faden to try and get him balanced in all positions. So these can be very complicated and you're unlikely to get them normal motility and perfect in all positions, but you can improve them significantly. Now, retinal detachment repair can result in double vision in quite a significant number of patients. Now it's less since we've moved to the trectomy, but it still exists because the muscles are slung to move the eye around and the vast majority of it will settle, but many patients have persistent problems. It's also not helped by the fact that if it's been MAC off and they've got macular damage, they really find it, they get image distortion, they get scotomas, and it may be very difficult to buy for really fuse for these patients. But they may also get this sort of scarred appearance where if they've had a band or if they've had multiple surgery, and this sticks um, the eye down so it doesn't move up and sometimes it doesn't move down. If they've had to have um, cryotherapy, the muscles may themselves be mechanically damaged. Local anesthetic into the muscle can also damage it. So there are a number of mechanisms for why patients post retinal detachment intervention can get diplopia. You first of all got to check with an AMSLA chart whether or not the patient has any possibility of fusing. If you put the eyes close together and they still can't bifurcally fuse or they've got a large scotoma, they are going to still have double vision. In the main, removing the explant doesn't help. There will be a few patients it does, but most of the time it doesn't because there's still the associated scarring and muscle damage. 
It's a good move to try a prism or botulinum toxin as a temporary uh, solution to see if the patients confuse. If that works, then it's very definitely worth going on to use adjustable sutures um, in your squint surgery to try and align the muscles. Aim to recess, not resect, because the muscle does not behave normally. So just as an example, this is a 22 year old who during the early lockdown um, got a retinal dialysis. He had a cryo buckle put in, the buckle was removed for infection. He got a very aggressive um, inflammatory response uh, with scleromalacia and a staphyloma. And he had a huge hypertropia with very limited down gaze. So when I explored him, I found that the inferior rectus muscle was hardly attached to the globe. Um, so what I did was I reattached it um, without resecting it. And he then had a hypotropia following that, which he was very upset about. And four weeks later, he had a large phoria, but he was able to control it with single vision and he didn't want anything else done. Another interesting condition is congenital fibrosis syndrome. Um, it usually affects the inferior rectus muscles and there are various approaches. There's a strabismus surgeon that we can use. We can do supramaximal recessions. You can just cut it and let it fly. Although I don't think I would recommend that because the muscles will stick to the globe and not necessarily work always where you want them or equally. You can consider if they're divergent, taking the lateral rectus muscles off and stitching them to the periosteal uh, walls or the soft tissue. And for verticals, I find that tutoplast um, expanders are really a good option. So this is bovine pericardium and you can cut it. It's, it stitches beautifully. You stitch it into the muscle and then you use that to expand the muscle. So it's not like just supramaximally recessing it. There is still an attachment to the insertion. So the globes move better. So tutoplast, I think is definitely something that you might want to think about in these particularly difficult cases. Now, strabismus surgeons sadly can also cause adhesive strabismus, and our classic one is after inferior oblique surgery. Um, if you deep dip, if you damage the artery to the inferior oblique, or you catch the orbital fat, you can get a sort of pseudo-Brown syndrome where you can't elevate. Now, this is particularly difficult for people who cycle, um, couriers, people who use racing bikes, um, if you play snooker, if you box, and if you're a dental surgeon, you can't look up into somebody's oral cavities if you get an inferior oblique adherence. The surgical options are to go and explore, clear the graft, but in this situation, you may well find that amniotic membrane grafting is extremely helpful. And you're, you can operate on the other side to bring the superior rectus down to sort of counterbalance. That doesn't always help if there isn't much of a deviation in primary, and many patients, understandably, don't want their good eye operated upon. Now, amniotic membrane graft comes from the amnion around the placenta. It's got three layers, and the great advantage about it is that it does not excite an immune reaction, so you don't need to immunosuppress your patient after using it. It reduces tissue adherence, it's been used um, in ophthalmology since 1940, and it was originally used for surface defects. And that's, I think, where most people will think about using it for pterygium repairs after Stevens-Johnson syndrome. Um, I used to use the frozen, but my institution has moved on to the dried, and I find that this is perfectly acceptable. And it's very good uh, you can either wrap it around the muscle to stop the muscle adhesing to the globe, or you can put it, you can split the conjunctiva and put it over the muscle and under the uh, tenons. And it works very well to reduce adhesion. Need, in this situation, you need to use it epithelial side up. And the Omnigen helpfully has a little marker on the surface to show you which way to put it in place. So what you do is you have to do a forced duction test to make sure that it is actually tight. You divide the adhesions, you recess the inferior rectus muscle, and you don't have to recess it as much as you think. Three millimeters is often enough. Take away the fibrotic conge, epithelial side up, and I, as I 
say there's a little marker so you can show which it is. I suture, I, I'm aware that some people have tried glue, I've never used glue. And I find that traction stitches to hold the eye into the position I want it to rest into for four to six weeks with proline tied over bolsters is a really good way to hold the eye in good position. The amniotic membrane has this slightly gluey, um, mucousy type appearance and it will heal into the tissue in four to six weeks. So an example here is a 30 year old gentleman who had squint surgery twice and he was worse after the second operation. He had a large hypotropia, he couldn't move the eye on elevation in adduction. So I went through the process I've just described and we put the traction stitches and you can see them here tied with proline around the bolsters. And five weeks after surgery, we took the bolsters out and he was in really good position. So this is not something you would use for primary surgery. Um, it's used for secondary surgery, but I do think it's very important. If you can use it early, um, by the time you get down to seven operations with a, a restrictive problem, AMG is going to have a very tough job to try and help you. So clear the adhesions and use the graft. You can't do adjustable sutures, and I do think that traction stitches help in this situation to hold the eye in a good position as it all heals. So in summary, restrictive strabismus surgery is a challenging and actually very interesting um, type of surgery for a strabismus surgeon to be involved with. Most of the time, we cannot make things completely normal. The patient will have some deficit in various positions of gaze. We're aiming to give them primary position single vision and if possible usually down gaze because for most people looking down for reading or for eating or down the stairs is the most important situation. But there are some people who need to be able to look up more than they need to be able to look down. So you need to have a discussion with the patient about what is and is not achievable and you have to be very realistic. You cannot promise 100% normality. But what you can say is we can help you, we can get you better in primary, and that will be helpful to you. But as I say, you have to be realistic about what you can achieve. So an interesting area for us to be involved in, lots of techniques to use, lots to think about. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jill. <clears throat> John. Jill, Back thank there. you very much indeed. Uh, one problem that I've seen occasionally is, for example, in a patient who's got some residual inferior oblique scarring, is that you get them nice and straight, then over a period of, say, six months or a year, the superior rectus on the other eye seems to start to overact in response to that as, as the yoke muscle. Have you seen that? Yes, but I still think that a lot of it is scarring around the inferior oblique. Um, you know, when you go and look at it, um, you, you often find scarring between the inferior rectus and the inferior oblique. And I do think that they, you can get some late scarring, particularly if people have breached the orbital fat pad. And I think that that's why it doesn't happen immediately. And I think the other yeah. thing that people forget to do, you need to do duction exercises, duction exercises, duction exercises after inferior oblique surgery. And if you don't do that, it all just glues down or can glue down. Um, <clears throat> Jill, um, did I understand it correctly that you uh, sutured the amniotic uh, membrane with uh, 8O Vicro? Yes. Uh, over uh, what uh, um, area of the globe? Well, you, you basically, rather like the plastic surgeons, if you're put, air putting a graft in, you, you, you think of it, you get a number for your sheet and then you double it. And it only comes in two sizes, young gen. So I usually just say, can I have the biggest sheet possible? Because I sort of pack it down as well as suturing it around the edges. You don't want it too tight because if it's, if it's too tight, and you put your stitches in, it's going to split and it's yeah. not going to work. So it really, it's kind of, it's packing and laying it into the tissue. Thank you. Pleasure. Uh, John, any more questions from the audience? There are none from the audience, no. Okay. 
I will certainly encourage the audience to type in the questions. Now is your chance. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Jill. Then we, uh, uh, <clears throat> I would like to now welcome our next speaker, uh, uh, Eddie Mazer, who will discuss intermittent uh, uh, strabismus, uh, more a basic uh, uh, presentation. Uh, and Eddie is a pediatric ophthalmologist uh, from uh, Israel. Eddie, please go ahead. This talk is intended to show only some of the many types of the ocular misalignment that may manifest intermittently and not in all positions of gaze. I will address conditions that parents might report as an intermittent eye misalignment. Therefore, this will cover not only traditional types, such as intermittent exotropia, seen in this slide. Intermittent strabismus in this presentation denotes any eye misalignment that is not seen all the time. It is sometimes present from birth and manifests only when the baby starts to fix on and follow visual targets. Or it may persist or appear at a later age. Therefore, both teenagers and adults may also have intermittent strabismus and not only children. Intermittent strabismus is not necessarily sinister. Some types, however, may deteriorate to a constant tropia. This in turn can induce a lazy eye if it occurs during the first years of life. The tropio amblyopia may induce social rejection and lead to a low self-esteem. Moreover, both may result in long-term psychological implications. When does intermittent strabismus manifest? It may occur occasionally in primary position under certain conditions when the subject is tired or daydreams. In other instances, it may manifest on side gazes. Please refer anyone, especially a child with suspected intermittent strabismus to a pediatric ophthalmology unit for a full orthoptic assessment. So here are a few examples to illustrate intermittent strabismus. First, we will discuss the cases that are seen in primary position. Cyclic isotropia is an uncommon condition of alternation between orthotropia and isotropia. It occurs in regular intervals usually every day. Observe the left isotropia on day one, orthotropia on day two, recurrence of the left isotropia on day three, orthotropia on day four, and again, the left isotropia on day five. It may appear spontaneously after orbital or ocular trauma or surgery or due to neurological causes. It is amenable to treatment, such as surgery or botulinum toxin injection. Many small babies have epicanthal folds or telecanthus that makes their eyes look crossed. The baby in the picture may look like he has isotropia. However, the telltale that the child is orthotropic is the corneal reflex that is central in both eyes. Some children have accommodative isotropia and may seem to have an intermittent isotropia when they do not put on their glasses. Notice the left isotropia in this child. Cycloplegic refraction reveals a high hypermetropic refractive error, plus seven diopters in the right eye and plus eight in the left eye. When the child wears a full hypermetropic correction, the need to accommodate disappears and the eyes become straight. A subclass of accommodative isotropia are children with a high accommodation to convergence ratio. They have more isotropia at near, as we can see in this case. Bifocals or progressive addition lenses will eliminate the isotropia at near. Again, the unaware parent will report that the child has intermittent strabismus when he takes off his glasses, especially when he looks up close. A classical example of intermittent strabismus is shown in this case. The baby has intermittent exotropia that alternates between the right and the left eyes. Some cases may improve over time or stay stable while others will deteriorate to a constant exotropia and will need surgery. The exotropia is mostly seen when the child daydreams, becomes tired, or is exposed to bright daylight. DVD or dissociated vertical deviation is part of the infantile strabismus complex or occurs following other congenital causes that disrupts early development of binocular vision. 
It manifests when the subject daydreams or when the affected eye is occluded. Most often, this represents a benign condition that does not require a neurological workout. The following example will illustrate intermittent strabismus that is apparent only on side gazes. In white pattern exotropia, we can see that there is no ocular deviation in primary position. However, it becomes visible when the, when the patient looks straight up, when he looks to the right and when he looks to the left. The Y pattern is one of several types of alphabet pattern strabismus. A Y pattern strabismus might be due to several possibilities, often due to an overaction of the inferior oblique muscles, as we can see in these photographs. And sometimes it may occur secondarily to craniofacial syndromes. In congenital fourth nerve palsy, the child appears orthotropic on right head tilt or left gaze. The deviation becomes apparent in primary position as well as on right gaze or left head tilt. Many patients adopt a compensatory head posture to align their eyes. In Brown syndrome, the strabismus manifests when the patient tries to elevate the eyes in adduction. The inability to elevate the eye is secondary to problems involving the superior oblique tendon or sheath in the area of the trochlea. It may be secondary to congenital or acquired causes such as trauma, surgery, or inflammation. Wayne syndrome is one of several congenital cranial disinnervation syndromes and represents a clinical spectrum that is usually non-progressive. In this case, this genesis of the abducens nerve nucleus leads to an aberrant innervation of the lateral rectus muscle by the third cranial nerve. This condition can manifest in several ways. In this example, the eyes in primary position are straight. However, we can see both an upshoot and downshoot in reduction of the left eye. And lastly, we can observe a limitation in abduction. The take home message is to refer any patient of yours, especially children, with their reported intermittent strabismus to a pediatric ophthalmology team. This will allow to rule out a true ocular misalignment and detect or prevent potential amblyopia and psychosocial problems. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, uh, Adi, for this nice uh, uh, overview uh, uh, and presentation. Uh, uh, one of the things I have learned over the years is that uh, uh, technology uh, becomes more helpful. Uh, often the, the, the parents say, well, when, uh, when their little child is uh, uh, tired uh, uh, or uh, cranky, uh, then they see uh, that the eyes are not straight. And when they're in my uh, uh, examination room, uh, everything uh, seems to be uh, normal, uh, orthotropic, uh, 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 et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, some of these parents are so clever to make a video or a flash photograph uh, when the uh, strabismus is occurring. And, and I think that will be a, a really uh, helpful uh, because nowadays um, all parents and most of the children have uh, a mobile phone which you can make uh, a video. Yes, I agree. I encourage parents to uh, send me an email with the attached uh, video clips or uh, stills uh, or they show me on the spot. They, they take out their phones and show me the uh, an example. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, what is also uh, quite uh, uh, reassuring that some of these uh, uh, patients, especially the, the uh, younger than one year old, uh, they come in with uh, pseudo isotropia. And then uh, I show the parents uh, take a flash photograph and then look uh, where the uh, reflection of the of the flash photo is and then explain them that it's not uh, the amount of conjunctiva. 
which you can see nasally compared to uh, uh, temporally, uh, that shows the uh, uh, the uh, strabismus, but that uh, where the uh, both eyes are fixating, uh, that's where uh, there is uh, either uh, real strabismus or pseudostrabismus. Yeah, John, do you have any, uh, yeah. John, do you have any more questions for uh, Edie? Yeah, e Edie, what are, what are your indications for doing surgery in a child with intermittent exotropia? Well, uh, it depends if it's a child, if, uh, if it's a teenager, if it's an adult, uh, because I look at several uh, factors. Uh, the classical factor is more than 50% uh, of the time uh, of manifesto business. Uh, with the deterioration of uh, visual faculties such as uh, stereo acuity um, or amblyopia. Uh, but I also take into account beyond the endogenic age, uh, social discrimination uh, and uh, emotional uh, considerations. Uh, so it's not enough to have uh, most of the time uh, uh, distant uh, manifest uh, strabismus and uh, chorea is near, but I need those additional uh, factors. All right, thank you. So, John? Right, we continue on the theme of intermittent exotropia. Our next speaker is Donnie Sue from the University uh, of California at Irvine, and he's going to talk about the use of over minus lenders in children with intermittent exotropia. Donnie, over to you, thank you. Hello, my name is Donnie Saw. I'll be presenting the results from the randomized trial evaluating effectiveness of overmanus spectacles in children with intermittent exotropia or IXT on behalf of pediatric eye disease investigator group. Here's a list of writing committee members and we do not have any financial interest or relationships with this group. The study was funded by the National I Institute. Overmanus lens therapy is a non-surgical treatment option for IXT. It is typically used as a temporary treatment to improve control before considering orthoptics or surgery. Some clinicians use it as a long-term intervention by gradually decreasing the power of overmanus lenses and eventually discontinuing them. A pilot RCT, randomized control study by Pettig, found that overmanus lenses improved distance exotropia control only after eight weeks of treatment. The primary study objective for our study was to assess the treatment effect of overmanaged lenses on distance IXT control after 12 months of treatment. We also weaned the participants off of treatment so that we could assess the off-treatment effect of overmanaged lenses on distance IXT control. The control was measured three times throughout each exam and mean of three measures was used to, for data analysis. We measured IXT control at distance and near using the exotropia control score, as you can see here. The examiner assigned the score from zero to five, zero being excellent control with mild phoria, five being constant exotropia or worse control. We enrolled participants three to less than 11 with moderate to poor control IXT. The distance control score had to be two or worse and magnitude of EXO had to be at least 15 prism doctors at distance. Participants could not have had prior strabismal surgery or orphan therapy more than one doctor. Refective error had to be between one to minus six doctors in the least hyperopic eye. After participants were enrolled, they were randomized to either over minus or non over minus spectacles. The strength of the over minus spectacles was 2.5 doctors. They were seen at six months and 12 months. At 12 months visit, over minus lens strength was reduced by half to 1.25 doctors. And at 15 months, over minus lens therapy was discontinued, and all participants were non over minus spectacles. Participants then came back at 18 months for the final visit for their off-treatment outcome visit. The study visit completion was excellent in uh, both groups. 
And also based on a parental report, compliance with spectacle wear at 12 months was excellent at 76% of the participants in both treatment groups. So what do we find? The control score was 3.2 in both groups prior to the enrollment. And in over minus group, it improved to 1.8. However, in the non over minus group, it remained at 2.8. And this was statistically significant. However, the improvement in the intermittent exophia control uh, in the over minus group dissipated once the over minus correction was weaned off down to 2.4. However, the, one of the major concerns associated with the over treatment is myopic progression. In this study, we measured change in refractive error from baseline to 12 months. And there's a 0.42 diopter of myopic shift in the over group and essentially no change in the non over group. And the difference of 0.38 diopters was statistically significant. We also looked at the proportion of children having more than one diopter of myopic shift, and 17% of the children treated with overmanus spectacles had one diopter or more of myopic shift compared to only 1% in the non overmanus group. We also assessed the change in refractive error according to the baseline refractive error. For children with a baseline myopic correction of minus six to minus five diopters, there was a 1.07 diopters of myopic shift compared to only 0.16 diopter of myopic shift in the non over group with a difference of 0.84 diopters between the treatment groups. And of course, it was statistically significant, whereas for, ch for children who are not myopic at baseline, there was 0.23 diopters in the over group and with no myopic shift in the non over group, which the, the difference was much less. Looking at the proportion of children who have had more than one diopter of myopic shift for children who are not myopic at baseline, and it's 8% for over group versus less than 1% for the non over group. And for children who are myopic at baseline, from minus six to minus 0.5, it was 51% for the over minus group compared to only 2% in the non over minus group. That's a 22 fold increase, a striking difference. So, in conclusion, the over minus lens treatment improves distance IXD control, but the treatment effect is not retained once it is discontinued. And over minus treatment increased the risk of myopic shift significantly if the child already had baseline myopia. So the risk of increased myopia should be discussed with parents if over minus correction is being considered for IXT control. But there are a few things to consider, keep in mind, when we apply these research result, a result to clinical practice. First, our findings can only be generalized to children three to 10, uh, sharing similar clinical characteristics as our study cohort and using the same over minus uh, dose and weaning schedule. We also do not know whether myopic shift we found is permanent or temporary, and we're continuing to collect the data, the effective error data, in extension phase of our this study. Thank you very much for your time. Donnie, thank you very much. Uh, I, I think your point about not knowing whether persist is important. Uh, do you have any data on axial lengths in these children? In other words, was, was the increase in myopia due to increased growth of the eye, or was it a change in an accommodative tone? Uh, John, thank you uh, very much uh, for that question. Uh, first, uh, you know, I think this result somewhat surprised us, including myself. And uh, we did not have a baseline axial length. So we don't know whether this is a, as a result of the axial, uh, axial, uh, axial length growth or if it's a, a corneal and lenticular changes. But um, we do know that it's a, uh, there is a significant myopic shift. And I, I do, for, you know, just based on my anecdotal, my personal experience, I do think that the axial length may be impacted. 
uh, Donny, yeah. <clears throat> uh, how um, enthusiastic were the parents uh, if you uh, uh, would uh, advise them to give over minus glasses, or did they, or did they not know that you would over minus these uh, children? Were they randomized? Well, they were randomized, of course. Uh, you know, um, I mean, I, I, I personally, again, I can't speak for the others, but uh, personally, I did not know that the uh, the myopic progression was going to be this significant. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, obviously, when we consented these patients, uh, you know, we did discuss the the possibility of ha of them having um, uh, some degree of myo myopic uh, progression. But uh, uh, yes, so back to your question. Um, uh, they were randomized um, mm -hmm. either to a uh, uh, over minus correction or no over minus correction, uh, and they are they were fully aware of the the potential um, uh, the side yeah, effect okay, of yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, how um, how popular is this in uh, in the United States? In in our country, we we almost never do it. You know, I can't speak on behalf of um, uh, on behalf of everyone in the United States, but obviously yeah. there was enough interest in our group of uh, the pediatric eye disease investigator group, and we actually have 300 different sites all over the country, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and we actually had enough interest, enough people practicing uh, over minus correction for us to proceed with the study. And personally, I, I mean, I did. Uh, you know, I wouldn't say it was a very significant mm -hmm. portion of my practice. But I did, I do, uh, I did, uh, you know, uh, practice over minus correction, even in my own practice, um, you know, for those patients that just were not uh, interested in, uh, uh, you know, they're bothered by the uh, intermittent exotropia, uh, they're bothered by the appearance, bothered by intermittent diplopia, even some of these patients, as you know, sometimes they can actually have blurred vision and even have intermittent diplopia. So these patients, um, and, but they're not really interested in surgery. Uh, and as uh, so it's a, um, it's something that we use as a uh, kind of like a, you know a bridge um, yeah. uh, before yeah. we can and, and until you uh, yeah. until yeah. you go into surgery. Yeah, yes, I, 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 I certainly it. used it in children who had poor control. Yes, just as a as a sort of temporizing measure. But as you know, than... yeah, John. But you know, as you know, some people actually um, you know they like this therapy, so they like to prolong it, like you know sometimes more than a year or to two years. But I do think that the uh, that the result of the study should be considered uh, when you're discussing the the options. Sure, oh, certainly very good data. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Donny. And now we will uh, go to uh, our last speaker, uh, Jan Peter Sante, uh, who will discuss inferior uh, oblique uh, anterior nasal transpositioning. Uh, and John Peter is uh, a famous uh, strabismologist and pediatric ophthalmologist from Copenhagen, Denmark. John Peter, please. So, uh, welcome to uh, the talk on the uh, inferior oblique nasal enter and nasal transposition. My name is John Peter Sounder, and I work in Copenhagen. And I thanks to my my um, colleagues in Copenhagen for preparing this talk with me. I do have financial disclosure not relevant to this talk. So I would like to share a case with you. This is a seven-year-old boy. He has infantile isotropia, DVD, and he has normal visual acuity. And even though he has infantile isotropia, he has actually quite a nice stereo acuity. He had uh, prior to coming to our clinic, bilateral medial rectus recessions, bilateral super recessions, because of incompetence, he had a left super uh, recession, uh, less left super rectus antiposition uh, afterwards. So this is when he presented to us with a 30 degrees head tilt to the right shoulder. And when you look at this boy, he has a left hypertropia in primary, and he does not have a very big inferior oblique overaction. And looking at side gaze, he's um, is quite well aligned, but he has something wrong with the left eye who does not go down. So to try to understand what's going on with this kid, we look at him uh, here, he has a head tilt. When we close his right eye, he's not focusing with the left, he still has a head tilt, but when he focuses with the right eye, his head tilt seems to get less. 
So maybe the left eye is driving the head tilt. So we try to find out how much exactly torsion does he has. Well, Dogmatox in children is not very easy, but it seems he has an excyclotorsion. torsion. And we'll look at the fundi. We can see here there is a left excyclotorsion torsion at least 15 degrees or more. So to try to understand what's going on here, this is what happens if you have a, a one eye with excyclotorsion torsion here demonstrated in the right eye. And how can we compensate to take care of this? Well, if you turn the head to the opposite shoulder, the two eyes would be aligned. So if you have some excyclotorsion torsion in one eye, by tilting your head, the eyes can work together again. So we believe that's what's going on with this kid. And our question is now, how do we take care of this uh, torsion and head tilt in this boy? Well, we could take care of the exactly torsion with a Harada Ijo suture, a Harada Ijo technique. We wanted to do that. But when we looked at this left eye, uh, the super oblique was so scarred and not available for surgery, unfortunately. So what options do, do, does this leave us with now? Well, we could do the inferior rectus nasal transposition. We can move the, we could uh, work on the inferior oblique is in both eyes with a myectomy, a transposition, or we could move the inferior oblique nasally and anteriorly, the IOM uh, procedure. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. So if you want to work on the inferior oblique muscle, if you make a normal inferior oblique transposition, this is a eye, right eye seen from below. Then we move <clears throat> the inferior oblique muscle from the, the temporal part of the eye, move it inferiorly. Now the eyes, um, and you can suture here on the temporal side of the inferior rectus. You can even uh, put it further forward. So it will actually work as a depressor. And what happens if, is if you move the eye nasally, the, the inferior oblique nasally, the, the muscle will completely change the, the way it works from before an excyclotorter and uh, elevator. Now it's actually depressor and intorter. And the reason why that happens is that the cardiovascular bundle uh, holding onto the inferior oblique here in this uh, picture as yellow, will actually be the insertion, the way the, 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 um, the way the muscle acts, that it pulls. And we found that if you do the inferior oblique into anterior nasal transposition, this will actually correct 15 to 25 personal vertical deviation in primary. So um, before we do this, uh, uh, surgery, we need to check how tight are the inferior oblique and super oblique muscles. So we push the eye into the orbit. And by doing this, you can actually test the tightness of the muscles. And we put the numbers, the exact torsion of both eyes on the whiteboard in the operation room. And in, in these cases, when you want to see how tight the super and oblique, inferior oblique muscles are, um, it's important to put the numbers on at once so you don't mix them up. So we wanted to do the inferior oblique nasal transposition. And I didn't do this uh, surgery my, myself before. So I traveled to India and met a good friend, Pradip Sharma, and sh he showed me how to do this. And what he showed me is that if you take the inferior oblique and uh, cut it uh, from the original insertion, it's possible to suture it when you hold the, the end of the muscle up here. And sorry for the um, blurry image, but what we do is we make a nasal opening in the conjunctiva. Uh, the muscle is sitting here temporarily, but we want to place it here nasally. And then you can actually grab a, a forceps and pull the muscle all the way in nasally over here. So, by doing this, we suture the inferior oblique, which was originally sitting here. Now we suture it here on the nasal side. And what happens is that this changes the muscle's um, direction uh, completely. So let's go, to, uh, go back to our seven-year-old boy. This is after the surgery, one year after surgery of the left inferior oblique. And if you look at him here, <clears throat> he has now the, the head tilt is, is only five degrees. and um, 
he's um, he's author in primary and has uh, nice uh, ductions and inversions. So if you want to correct the large inferior oblique overactions, like in congenital fourth nerve palsies, like in this gentleman, we have a very large hyper, right hyperphoria in primary, which turns even more in left side gaze. So if you want to correct this uh, large deviation, usually you need to do a two muscle surgery. Problem is if you do a inferior oblique muscle surgery here, and then the inferior on this eye, you will have problems in the ipsilateral gaze and have overcorrection this side. So we did an inferior oblique overaction, no, inferior oblique um, anterior cell transposition. And this is the patient a few weeks after the uh, surgery, which took care of the large overaction um, and side gaze. So we looked at this technique for some time and we found that uh, if we do the inferior oblique uh, anterior nasal transposition, uh, at baseline, we change um, the deviation up to 21 uh, prism doctors. And uh, the inferior oblique overaction can be reduced by uh, 2.6 on a scale from zero to four. And mostly, which is important, is that if you do this inferior oblique nasal transposition, we can also correct exacular torsion up to nine degrees. So are there any risk and problems doing this? What about anti-elevation after IOANT? Well, we know that from other studies, if you do inferior oblique transposition, up to 15% of the patients might have anti-elevation syndrome. But in our cases with 55 patients, we only found two patients had this and they needed a re-operation. That's a 4%. So what we found in our group was that we use inferior oblique uh, and anterior nasal transposition in your oblique overactions, grade three to four, we use it to correct exocyclic torsion, hypertropia, and we always use adjustable sutures so we can fine tune the amount of uh, vertical and torsional correction in the surgery. It's a one muscle procedure, gives an average nine degrees correction of exocyclic torsion, and it produces on average 21 prism diopters decrease in vertical deviation. And it decreases the inferior oblique overaction at average 2.6 in the zero, zero to four degree uh, scale. Last thing I want to share with you is um, our whiteboard with, from the, for the operation room, which we use for all the cases. And we use this to document and to try to get an uh, overview of all the complex cases, and we also use this to, to uh, discuss, uh, if we need to discuss difficult cases, we can use this uh, condensated um, chart, medical chart for, for the patients. And we have made this available for you if you want to use it. Uh, it's a whiteboard uh, printed um, uh, whiteboard. So the pattern here, the, the layout can be downloaded for free. And um, you can, uh, it's a PowerPoint version, so you can change anything to your uh, discretion, which, which works with you and your clinic, but please be useless if you want to. And if you have any questions, please see me. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Jon Peter. <clears throat> Uh, uh, this is an uh, interesting uh, technique. I, th I think the first time I heard uh, of it was by um, David uh, Steger, uh, Steger Jr. or Steger uh, uh, Senior, uh, um, about 15 years ago, I think. But I, uh, 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 I, I find it uh, an, uh, interesting uh, and quite um, delicate uh, surgery. Uh, uh, what is interesting is that you uh, did not get any, uh, how do you call it, uh, uh, adherence, uh, uh, adherence syndromes, at, at least uh, uh, far less than you would have in, uh, in uh, other cases. Uh, how important was this conjunctival bridge <clears throat> you showed uh, uh, from that uh, case uh, who was operated in uh, in India? Uh, does that help to uh, to avoid 
um, adherence syndrome? Thank you, Anshir. I think that's a very good question. I, um, in India, actually, Pradeep Sharma made a full limbal opening to, uh, to oh, okay. move the uh, muscle. Uh, the video, actually, the videos I would have shown you, which didn't work, so that's you know, how it was only photos. Yeah. Um, these, the, this is how we do it in Copenhagen, where we make a small uh, fornix incision mm -hmm. and a small fornix incision nasally, and we make the uh, tunnel under the conjunctiva, but the, on the inferior side of the inferior, inferior rectus. And I, so I believe you can have, sorry. So underneath, so you pull the inferior uh, oblique underneath the inferior rectus. Yes, away from the eye, from yeah. on the on the orbital side of the inferior rectus. Okay. The inferior yeah. rectus is closest to the eye, and then the inferior yes. oblique travels uh, on the orbital oh. side yeah, yeah. nasally. Yeah. Yes. So um, we were very worried about the anti elevation syndrome. I actually discussed it with Bert Kushner a few years ago, and he said you you need to be careful because this will produce anti-elevation syndrome. Uh, and we were looking very carefully for this and we found this in two patients now in the 55 patients group. So it, it can happen, but what we did in these two cases was to, to loosen the sutures, the adjustable sutures uh, on, the, on the nasal side, and then we could avoid the anti-elevation. Yeah, how long follow-up do you have on these patients? Yes, we have been doing this now for three years. So uh, in the group here, I think uh, the follow-up is down to one month, but some of them we now have three, three years of follow-up on. And, and we usually after six months, we, we, we leave them and we tell them to come back if they have uh, problems and we haven't seen any of those late overcorrections or undercorrections. But I, I'd like to come with, uh, answer one more question to Jan Tiers comment on the yeah. anti-elevation syndrome because doing the inferior oblique surgery uh, for me changed dramatically the moment I, I try, began to use the Helveston Barbie retractor. I don't know if you know this instrument, which I is know, a yeah. nice plated instrument and you can hold the uh, conjunctiva and the tenons away from the eye and you have room to see, visualize the insertion of the inferior oblique and you can neatly cauterize and cut it without all the orbital fat coming up into the field and after we began using this instrument instrument we had much much better results yeah it's uh, when you can see what you do that's always very helpful <laughs> exactly <laughs> you, you've done a big series uh john uh what do you think other surgeons are doing for these patients with similar problems what are the alternative managements well, for the excitotorsion, of course, the Harada Ido or the inferior rectus transposition. Um, for the grade three and four inferior oblique overactions, usually people do a two muscle procedure with the inferior oblique transposition or myectomy and then go on the other eye to take, do the inferior rectus recession. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the, the, the interesting part about this surgery is you have only, it, it's a one muscle surgery and it seems to be quite, quite self adjusting. So we've been surprised that it's, we have so few reoperations in these and uh, it seems to, to, to give us what we need. So, so the, the patients are very diverse, but this seems to, to take care of this in a good way. And another thing we found as, as a, as a um, alternative to Harada Ito, it, it helps us because the Harada Ito seems to, seems to unwind over time. We know that when you tighten the superior oblique, it will go looser and then you lose some of the torsional effect. But this is a this is a this is not a paretic muscle. So when you put it on, mm. it stays working this way. How, how much of the effect do you think is from disinserting an overall active inferior oblique, and how much from the reinsertion side? Exactly. I think I think that's a very good point. And I think actually this takes you have both advances here. You you get rid of the overaction. And you also use the muscle as an active force. When you do a myectomy, you just get rid of it, the muscle and you don't need it anymore. But here we can actually take advantage of the muscle pulling the opposite way to, to pull the eye down if you have very severe overaction. 
Okay, <clears throat> thank you very uh, much. Uh, are there any more questions from the audience, not from other uh, participants, uh, panelists? If not, then uh, I would like to thank uh, everybody for uh, uh, their uh, presentations, uh, attentions and questions. Uh, I'd like to uh, uh, thank my co-moderator John Sloper and the ESA for uh, um, supplying half of the uh, speakers. And uh, I would like uh, uh, to thank the uh, IPOS, the International Pediatric Ophthalmology Society uh, uh, and Strabismus uh, Council for uh, uh, the other three uh, presenters. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. And as mentioned before, uh, you can uh, see all of this back uh, uh, at the SOE uh, website uh, and on the YouTube uh, channel if you have missed something or tell your uh, colleagues that they missed something, then they can see what they missed. Thank uh, you very and much. Also, also, please remember there will be a short survey available immediately after this. Please do give us your feedback. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.